Sarah's relatively recently joined the, the law school. She joined us from the University of Southampton Law School, where she was lecturing in employment law and was founding director of the Stephen Cross Research Centre for Women, Equality and Law. And of course, that then gives us an indication of her research interest and basically what really interests Sarah is the how. It's the idea of how you can improve the effectiveness of equality law. And she looks at a variety of regulatory tools, tools such as equality institutions, positive duties. She looks at alternative dispute resolution, uh, resolution and uh, collective redress. Um, so her current project is that she's undertaking an analysis on pay transparency regulations, which are aimed at or which hope to address uh, gender pay gaps and um, hate speech. But today's topic, today's one's very topical to do with Brexit. Of course, I've been saying that for several years to my students about, oh, we have a very topical subject today, Brexit. But today's subject really is very timely. It's EU nationals vulnerability in the context of Brexit. And she's particularly looking at Polish nationals. So it's a great pleasure to hand over to Sarah to hear her talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mary Catherine, for your very nice introduction and also to Suzanne for inviting me to do this research seminar, which I'm very excited about. So uh, I will now share my screen. So basically, the, this presentation is based on a, on a paper that was the main outcome of a project uh, that I undertook in 2018, 2019, more or less, with a colleague from my previous institution, the University of Southampton, um, Dr. Ingi, Ingi Yusman, who is an associate professor in politics. Um, so um, basically, uh, we uh, looked at the vulnerability of EU nationals, and in particular, in particular the case of Polish nationals in the context of Brexit. And um, we secured some um, seed funding uh, from the University of Southampton and also from the ESRC uh, Impact Acceleration Account to conduct some empirical um, um, research. We collected some data and then we um, analyzed it and published this paper, which I'm going to present today. So um, what I'm going to talk, uh, uh, firstly, I will take you through uh, some pre 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 preliminary considerations. So what was the sociopolitical and research context of Brexit? And I will explain to you what is our theoretical framework based on the idea of vulnerability. Then I will briefly uh, talk you through the methodology of the, of the project, which was a bit complex because we used uh, mixed methods. Um, so I won't uh, elaborate a lot about it, but I think it's important to understand it so you, you can really understand what we did. And then I will take you through the most interesting parts through the, through the findings. So um, starting with the preliminary considerations, I think it's important firstly to acknowledge that Brexit didn't happen in a, in a vacuum, right? Um, so before the referendum, uh, we already uh, could see certain trends in uh, British politics and public debates. So there was a clear rise of populist and in anti-immigration um, uh, discussions and, and um, uh, discourses. So uh, there were institutional and a certain institutional and governmental hostility uh, clearly towards EU nationals. Uh, for instance, O'Brien has identified how uh, EU nationals very often face difficulties with the Home Office to uh, do any sort of paperwork related to their EU rights, whether um, renewing um, uh, you know, um, um, family members, renewing their residence cards and many other sorts of uh, problems in dealing with the e, uh, UK institutions. There was also uh, very clearly um, a, a trend of negative, uh, negative media coverage of EU nationals, particularly Eastern Europeans uh, in relation, for instance, also with the accession and especially after accessions in 20, um, 
in the 2000s, there was a politics of othering, as, as some uh, authors have called it, uh, you know, scapegate, scapegoating uh, Eastern European migrants for problems in the NHS, tell, saying that, you know, they uh, are invading us, they are, uh, you know, living on subsidies, um, uh, homogenizing also and racializing these uh, migrant groups, talking about floods of migrants, invasions, etc. Um, and this was also found by the political establishment, uh, most notably uh, by certain parties like the UKIP and the British Nationalist Party. Uh, not the, UP, the UKIP obviously used uh, instrumentalized um, these media reports also, uh, you know, to to um, encourage uh, debates about Brexit and leaving the EU and so on, but also mainstream parties like Labour and the Conservatives uh, even used that kind of discourse uh, to talk about migrants. So um, this, to some extent, led also to discriminatory incidents and, and hate crime incidents. So. Um, Several authors have identified this. They talk about negative attitudinal climate and a negative receiving context for um, migrants, particularly for Eastern Europeans who have been increasingly uh, racialized, uh, particularly uh, you know, from the what, the what are called the A2 and A8 uh, migrant countries, so Eastern European countries, due to their foreign look, accent, their foreign plates, um, also, uh, several authors have identified uh, difficulties uh, from this group uh, to access the labor market or the fact that they suffer ethnic penalties. So they are uh, underpaid very often and they are overqualified also very often for the types of jobs they tend to do. And um, already before the, the Brexit referendum, there was a clear rise in um, xenophobic attitudes towards these groups. Um, for instance, McDavid identifies a tenfold increase in xenophobic hate crime between 24 and uh, 2013, uh, 20, uh, sorry, 2004 and 2013. And uh, some authors also report that uh, Eastern Europeans were living in fear already before the, the referendum because they felt, for instance, general uh, hostility from their neighbors and other Britons. So there was already all this going on before uh, the Brexit referendum was announced. Um, but I will leave that here for the time being and I will come back to this uh, in a minute, but for the moment I will uh, briefly uh, talk about our theoretical framework, which is based on the concept of vulnerability. So as you may know, this concept uh, comes from uh, Latin, from the word vulnus, which means bound. And it has, um, it's, it, it has largely been used in the social legal context by uh, Feynman, who talks about uh, vulnerability as a universal, inevitable aspect of the human condition. However, in this uh, paper, we also argue that it can also be a relational concept um, because uh, individuals live in a social context and uh, it has been used actually um, in some legal context to um, describe the relationships between individuals and uh, their surroundings according to objective factors. So for instance, the European Court of Human Rights um, uses the concept of vulnerability in some judgments to refer to gypsies as a minority, or uh, the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons uh, with Disabilities refers uh, in particular to girls and women who are also disabled as being more vulnerable. Um, and it has also been used uh, to describe how we comprehend our relations with others. Uh, in other words, uh, it has also been used to describe more kind of subjective perceptions of vulnerability. So again, uh, the European Court of Human Rights refers a, a bit more in this way uh, to uh, women who are victims of domestic violence, violence because how they themselves perceive um, them, themselves, um, how they perceive fear and how they perceive uh, themselves in, in a context, in their context. And also the, e, the UK Equality Act, for instance, refers to uh, the concept of harassment 
both as a concept that has objective and subjective elements. And agreeably, the subjective elements also kind of relate to that idea of uh, vulnerability as a subjective concept. Um, in the socio-psychological uh, area, uh, actually this concept of subjective vulnerability has been widely used to refer to um, people feeling unprotected from danger, uh, feeling personal fragility, insecurity, to refer generally to stressful life events uh, related to, uh, to anxiety, fear, and uh, some kind of apprehension uh, in relation to uncertainty and threat about what's going to happen. Um, they have also used it uh, to refer uh, to perceptions of threat, discrimination, and also that kind of cumulative experiences of everyday indignities that perhaps are not very um, obviously perceived by others, but are perceived by the particular person. Um, so it has been linked in general in this area of social psychological research, uh, it has been linked to ontological insecurity. Um, so what we argue in this paper is that um, uh, subjective vulnerability can be applied in a social legal context, uh, basically um, uh, with two, 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 so we can talk about two dimensions of vulnerability. Uh, building on the individual's perceptions. We can talk on the one hand about objective vulnerability, um, which is based on um, external attributes uh, or characteristics of a certain group, for instance, their foreign look, uh, that often may lead to um, one of incidents uh, experienced by mem members of that group. Uh, so for instance, uh, hate crime incidents or um, discrimination incidents. And uh, we can also talk about subjective vulnerability. Um, so a bit in, in the sense of what uh, social, social psychological research um, um, has been arguing, uh, which is a, sub a vulnerability concept based on the individual feelings. Uh, so how a particular individual is feeling um, about um, a certain um, uh, um, in, in a certain context, uh, which may be linked to external events, linked to objective vulnerability, but may also uh, be linked to wider social trends. So the subjective vulnerability feelings of an individual may build on objective vulnerability experiences, one-off incidents, discrimination, etc. but it may also build on a wider social trends. Um, what is important to note is that in any event, both objective and subjective vulnerability are based on the individual perceptions of a particular person. Because measuring uh, racial discrimination in this case requires making attributions about another person's motivation in a specific situation. So in both cases, we are still talk, we, we talk about the individual perceptions. So, on the basis of those of that distinction between objective and uh, subjective vulnerability, what the, re the key research question in, in this project was how did the EU referendum campaign and the vote uh, impact the objective vulnerability and the subjective vulnerability uh, experienced by polls in Southampton? And, and what we argue in this paper is that the political debate the uh, institutional attitude towards migrants, uh, the media discourse, and also the changes in social behavior uh, linked to those uh, factors um, led not only to changes in objective vulnerability of, of this group, but also and especially to changes in subjective vulnerability. And we illustrate that with our case study based on the Polish community in Southampton. Um, so um, to uh, to do this uh, in our methodology, we use uh, uh, what Creswell calls convergent parallel mix methods. So we use both qualitative and quantitative data that we collected, and uh, we collected it in parallel, and then we analyzed it separately to determine whether there were convergent trends, whether they pointed towards the same trends uh, independently. And as I said, our case study was based on the Polish community in Southampton because uh, Southampton has one of the largest um, 
Polish communities in, in the UK. And it was also convenient, obviously, because we were based in Southampton. And we limited our um, sample uh, participants to uh, Polish people who had been in Southampton at least since 2014. So for the data collection, we uh, used seven semi-structured interviews with contact points. Uh, so basically people who are uh, very often in contact with uh, Polish nationals, either because they are advice providers or uh, because they work at the church or in Polish schools, uh, etc. We also conducted four focus groups with 21 uh, Polish participants in total. And then we uh, conducted an online survey in Polish um, and we had uh, 142 respondents. Um, I'm not going to say a lot uh, more about the data collection, which was a bit complex, but I will just say that the survey was based on a um, pre-existing questionnaire that is widely used to collect um, information on uh, racial discrimination that we adapted for uh, this purpose. And the participants basically, basically had to answer the same set of 22 questions twice. Uh, so they answered the same set of questions for the uh, first period, 2014-2015, which was the period before the referendum was announced. And then they answered exactly the same questions for the 2016-17 period, basically after the referendum was announced during the campaign and initial negotiations started. Out of the 22 uh, questions, um, 12 were linked to subjective vulnerability. So we used them to measure subjective vulnerability and 10 were linked to objective vulnerability and we used them to measure that uh, concept or that those changes. And uh, just uh, very briefly, as you can see here, um, we cannot claim that our respondents uh, overall our sample was representative of uh, Polish nationals in the UK or EU nationals. But looking, for instance, at the occupations uh, in general of EU nationals in the UK and the occupations of our participants, we can say that they were roughly in line more or less with EU nationals occupations. So most of them were employed. There were a few self-employed and a few students too, roughly in line with EU nationals occupations in the UK. And here's also a summary of the uh, interviewees um, uh, we, we contacted for our semi-structured interviews. I won't go through all of them, but just uh, for brief information. Um, in terms of the qualitative analysis, as I said, we analyzed the focus groups and interviews uh, separately. We coded them following three levels uh, as advised by Crushwell. And in terms of the quantitative analysis, um, uh, the 21 quantitative questions from the survey, we analyzed them using inferential statistical analysis. Uh, we took precautions to minimize the potential recollection bias. So the fact that uh, potentially respondents may not accurately remember how they felt uh, in 2014, for instance. So we tried to um, do some tests to, to check if there was some potential recollection bias and to minimize it. And we also did checks for validity and reliability uh, of the survey and reliability um, was uh, particularly good uh, in terms of uh, using the Kronbach Alphas reliability test. For the statistical analysis, uh, we used um, two different tests to uh, compare, basically, um, for the same questions, we compared uh, what the participants answered uh, for the first period and what the particip participants asked, answered for the second period. So before and after the uh, referendum and campaign. And uh, we used that to determine if there was a statistically a significant difference in, uh, in the cha in changes uh, between these two periods, between how respondents felt in these two periods about the same statement or about the same question. We used two tests for that, the T-test and the Wilkinson uh, sign rank test. I won't go through the details, but just for uh, information so you understand how we measured changes. So um, in terms of what we found, uh, I will start with the quantitative findings. Um, 
And I think it's important to note here that they are in line with uh, more general reports and also with what um, generally uh, are thought to be the, the, the effects of the referendum campaign. So the referendum campaign instrumentalized uh, the immigration debate to a large extent. The Leave campaign, for instance, tended to send a message that we need to leave the EU to stop immigration. And this created, according to some authors, like a heightened feeling among EU nationals that there was a threat in the air, perhaps not always um, materializing in something, but that there was this change in a way that after the, during the campaign and after the, the vote, that there was a threat in the air. There was more uncertainty about the EU national status and rights post-Brexit. And as a consequence also of these discourses and these feelings, there was a peak in discrimination and hate crimes incidents reported and registered right before and after the uh, referendum. Um, arguably not all of them might be uh, linked to, um, to the referendum, but the Home Office uh, in, uh, itself uh, has recognized that uh, it was uh, such an important increase that to some extent a part of it might be linked to the, to the referendum. So what we found is that whether the threat materialized in specific hate crime or uh, discrimination incidents or not, among our respondents and participants, there was a generalized feeling of higher subjective vulnerability after the referendum and the campaign. And we found statistically significant changes in 43% uh, percent of the survey items and 56% percent related to subjective vulnerability. And um, what is also an important finding is that the changes that we observed in subjective vulnerability were statistically more significant in general than the changes observed in objective vulnerability. So this, we think, might suggest that the experiences of subjective vulnerability um, have changed in the, in the respondents, in the Polish community, even without them being directly targeted by discrimination and hate incidents linked to their foreign origin. So simply because there was a threat in the air, there was already a change. So, um, we observe in this uh, quantitative uh, data, um, generally in terms of objective vulnerability changes, so an increase in of offensive comments, being called names in the street, for instance, unfair treatment at school by other pupils or in general between families, by service people, for instance, in the bus, um, and generally that Britons avoided contact with Polish uh, nationals more often. And we also observed changes in subjective vulnerability, uh, notably uh, respondents felt uh, less welcome, much uh, less uh, welcome. They perceived that they didn't fit more acutely than before, and they, were and they thought much more often about going back to their home countries. And as, as, as I will show uh, with some quotes and examples later, uh, this seems to be linked not only to direct experiences of objective vulnerability incidents suffered by the person herself, but also simply because of the feeling that a threat is in the air to some extent. So both uh, have a, an influence on subjective vulnerability. Um, just to give you a more, uh, quick uh, idea about how we found this uh, through the survey. Um, here is a table that shows you um, the questions uh, where we found that there were more statistically significant changes um, in how people felt um, in, the, in the second period compared to the first period. And so basically the three questions that relate to subjective vulnerability where there was a more significant change are these three. Did you feel welcome in the UK in the relevant periods? Did you ever consider going back to your country in the two relevant periods? How often were you made feel as though you don't fit in because of your dress, speech, or other characteristics related to your foreign origin? And if you look at the mean 
in each of the periods, you can see that for feeling welcome, there was a clear decrease. So there are three stars. This is the maximum level of significance. Um, there was an increase in uh, consideration of going back to your country and also an increase in um, feelings that they don't fit. In, in the three cases, this is the maximum level of significance that we have found. The question, uh, the, the most uh, relevant changes in terms of objective uh, vulnerability were found in question 9b, which relates is basically how often did you receive unfair treatment because of your foreign origin from school pupils or their families. And here again, if you look at the means, you can see an increase, which was also found to be uh, statistically very significant. I want uh, the other questions in this table were also found to be uh, statistically significant, but I won't. I don't have time to go through all of them, uh, but I just leave them there. Um, so these are our quantitative findings. How can we further explain that with our qualitative findings? Um, in terms of objective vulnerability, well. Official reports from the Home Office, as I said earlier, uh, found a very important increases in hate crimes, uh, racially motivated hate crimes, immediately after uh, the referendum and even a few months later. And our findings are in this line. So we found uh, many comments about uh, verbal abuse with frequent references to going back to your country incidents and harassment in schools, on streets, in buses, in shops, uh, problems with neighbors or with landlords simply saying, oh, but I won't rent you this, uh, this apartment anymore because you're not from the UK, so you are going to, you, you will have to go home uh, very soon and things like that. Also, very a lot of problems at work. So um, the GAP officer that we interviewed reported that uh, employers and colleagues were mistreating Polish citizens on the basis of their nationality. Sometimes they were not allowed to speak Polish to even during um, break times. And for instance, two of our survey respondents said, I had difficulties at work because of my foreign origin, um, discussions about Brexit, comments and different uh, treatment of me, or I informed my managers about humiliating me and physical threats from other employees, and eventually I have changed my job. Um, these sort of comments and behaviors, uh, we very often found that people recognize that um, they don't necessarily, are, they are not necessarily new, this kind of type of thinking, but what actually happened after the referendum and the campaign was that people just started to openly express what they thought before and didn't dare to say. So in a way, they, they felt more, more confident to show their dissatisfaction with immigrants. And they felt that the referendum and the Leave campaign in a way legitimized these thoughts and gave them more right and more confidence to say them out loud and to behave more openly about migrants um, after the, the referendum and the campaign and the, and the result. Um, in terms of uh, subjective vulnerability, what we found first was that there was a heightened sense of being different among our respondents. Uh, so they were more um, aware about their difference and their non-Britishness. So for instance, some of our um, focus group participants, uh, one of them said, it makes you so visible so suddenly to have this back, I'm a, I'm a migrant, I didn't feel it before Brexit. And a church representative that we interviewed said that uh, Poles have now become aware that people are watching them, uh, that they're not English, that they're not Irish, they are Polish. Um, and, and some seem, uh, they are aware that they, uh, some, some Poles feeling uh, that there's this ghetto mentality and uh, they only want to stay with their, with their own people. Um, this heightened sense of being different um, is also um, fostered by um, Britons looking more accurately are different, at different markers, such as accent language, uh, poor English, 
um, the fact that you're buying Polish products, for instance, these are used as different markers, different markers. Um, so some people said, for instance, people are picking on my accent. When I talk to my neighbors, I'm self-conscious about it. I think that I would be better treated if I spoke with a British accent and I'm seriously considering taking a class. So this is what they perceive. It doesn't necessarily happen to them that these um, migrant tax are used against them, but this is what these Polish people are perceiving. Um, and this is exacerbated sometimes by uh, Britons asking questions much more often about their origin, about how they feel in this country, whether they are happy or not, even if it comes out of the blue and it has nothing to do with the conversation. And this kind of exacerbates these feelings of being different and it kind of reminds them all the time when they are asked, where are you from? Are you happy here? It reminds them all the time that they don't belong. Um, this heightened sense of this of being different, uh, importantly, has been experienced um, by people who are really well integrated and had never experienced it before, and actually has never have never experienced uh, incidents uh, directly by themselves, either hate crime or discrimination, and also by people who have experienced uh, these type of incidents. So whether they personally they personally experience objective vulnerability or not there is a general uh, heightened sense of being different. So as this is illustrated by quotes A and B. As you can see in quote A, this person has experienced uh, um, hostility and to some extent discrimination because of her Polish origin. Uh, so she says, from 2015, I felt that British people and my friends changed their attitude towards me. There were more comments and discussion about immigrants. And um, at the moment, I feel very unwelcome here. I'm afraid to buy Polish products in shops like Tesco or to speak in Polish on the street. So again, different markers. But this person has felt a change and has to some extent felt experiences of discrimination to some extent, has perceived them herself. Whereas this other one, I'm married to a Brit and do not really engage in the Polish community. However, after the Brexit vote, there was a slight hesitation from me to go into a Polish shop or a worry I might actually look or sound different and so might be identified as a foreigner and so verbally abused. No such thing happened. So she has never experienced it. But after the referendum, she kind of felt it was more likely that it could happen. So she actually started avoiding Polish shops and you know, all kind of stopped doing all kinds of things that could identify her as a Polish person. So we argue that in both cases, these persons experience higher levels of subjective vulnerability, even if in the second case, there was no objective reason apparently, but it was just a feeling that hot something has changed, that this threat is in the air, as I said earlier. And we also found in the qualitative uh, data that um, there, there, there was a general feeling of uh, being unwelcome and uh, various degrees of otherness perceptions. Um, so there was a, a wide variety starting from a mild feeling of awkwardness all the way going to feeling uh, um, unsafe uh, and, 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 and really unwelcome. So you can see that in the quotes too. Uh, after the vote, Polish clients were saying, I just feel really bad, I feel awkward now. After the referendum, I started to feel unwelcome and that I am worse than a British people because of my foreign origin. I felt really vulnerable. Um, another person saying directly, I do not feel safe here anymore because of this hostile environment towards migrants. And, and generally, uh, uh, as I, I was just saying, we, we find that there is an increased feeling of subjective vulnerability whether uh, the, the respondents had experienced incidents of objective vulnerability against them individually or not. So for instance, you can see this in these two quotes too. Since 2016, I feel like I live in a different country, less tolerant 
hearing about the anti-migration campaigns, discrimination and attacks towards EU migrants is also disturbing. So this person has not necessarily have any um, negative experience, but she feels like that because she's hearing about it all the time. And uh, uh, secondly, this quote also shows this. The most profound change has been in the public discourse of the presence of Eastern Europeans in the UK, which changed from positive to very negative. And it, it did not affect me directly, but made me feel less welcome. Um, finally, uh, the last uh, important trend we found in the, in the qualitative data is a general confusion and anxiety about the future legal status and rights uh, in, this, in this group. Uh, there's a lot, there is and there was a lot of uncertainty uh, about residence work permits after Brexit, what people need to do to be able to stay in the UK and to keep their rights. And even people that have permanent residence felt that they have to apply uh, for a new document and immigration rules. Many people applied to become British if they were entitled to. Um, people said, for instance, because of Brexit, there was an unnecessary, unnecessary confusion created. A lot of Polish people became unsure about uh, their future and they decided to leave the UK. There's a lot of distress. Uh, this is an, an advisor from the Citizens Advice Bureau uh, who said there's a lot of distress. People are coming, being uncertain what is going to happen to me. They try to save money to apply for naturalization, which is very expensive right now um, because they live in fear about what is going to happen to them. Um, as I said at the beginning in the introduction, about the general context, um, there have been a lot of administrative injustices that O'Brien, uh, for instance, shows in her 2017 book. Um, in this general hostile environment uh, from the Home Office towards migrants, EU nationals were also affected and there were uh, passports retained, general denial of rights uh, in breach of EU free movement uh, law. Um, uh, for instance, we had an example given by the citizen's, citizen's advice officer about a person who applied uh, for passport renewal. So this was a person who was originally Polish and naturalized as a British uh, citizen. But because there was a rule when um, Poland joined the EU, uh, the UK uh, established a rule that um, Polish nationals and also from some other accession countries had to register in a special um, work register um, for their first, first whole year that they worked in the UK. They had to register in this special register. Many Polish workers didn't know about it and they didn't register in full for this first year. When this person applied for passport renewal after naturalization, they realized uh, she had not been registered for this full year in this register and uh, they retained uh, her passport, which caused an, you know, a huge amount of trouble and a lot of paperwork and effort to recover. Um, and this has translated into a flood of applications for permanent residence and nationality. Um, so again, this officer told us that uh, there has been a huge increase in European nationals trying to get resident documents because of the referendum, before the referendum even and afterwards even more. So a lot of people applying for permanent residence and British nationality too, apart from applying from the settled status and pre-settled status. And generally there's a lot of confusion on the paper where what needs to be done what is the pre-settled status? What is the settled status? What are the rights that the different statuses give you? Uh, not just the pre-settled status, the settled status, but also permanent residence, British nationality, etc. And because of this whole confusion, um, there have been people who have been denied access to homelessness services, to the NHS, and to all sorts of administrative services also at local level. So, um, just to uh, wrap up and finalize a bit um, and, and come to an end after all this discussion, 
Um, I think that what this shows is that the referendum exacerbated the pre-existing hostile environment that already was there. Um, and it led many Britons to feel much more confident and entitled to express xenophobic views around, uh, against foreigners and to behave also in a more xenophobic way. And Poles feel, um, as a consequence, subjectively more unwelcome, and they feel that their national origin accent and other foreign markers may now start to be a problem or a greater problem than before, at least. So we have observed changes in subjective vulnerability and objective vulnerability, um, but especially in subjective vulnerability, they may seem even more substantial than those ch the changes in objective vulnerability. And the changes in subjective vulnerability, as I explained, are not always necessarily linked to having suffered objective vulnerability or racist or discriminatory incidents in the first place. In, in, in first person. They may just be linked to what you have heard about other people, what you have heard in the media, what just you're feeling in, your gen in the general context in the environment around you. Of course, our um, project uh, has some limitations. Uh, our sample was relatively small and it focused in the Polish community in Southampton which it still is also diverse. There are people who have been in Southampton for more than 20 years, others who arrived in the last five years or less. And they all, they all have also different um, professional experiences, uh, etc. And what we, uh, our data are based also on subjective perceptions on the participants, because this is the only way really we can um, we can collect information about their experiences in, in terms of racial discrimination and objective and subjective vulnerability. Um, but it's a starting point, perhaps, for further research in this, in this area. And it also raises some questions about whether national and local government uh, have some duty to respond to these um, issues going on around objective and subjective vulnerability. And uh, whether they have a duty under the Equality Act 2010, uh, in particular under Section 149, to do something about this, because this section um, requires public authorities to have duty. It says that they have a duty to have uh, due regard to the need to eliminate unlawful discrimination, harassment, and victimization, and to foster good relations be between people who share a protected characteristic and those who not. So um, there, there, and I will, sorry, I will just finish saying that, um, again, we received funding for this uh, project from the ESRC in Acceleration Account and the University of Southampton. And that if you want to know more, the article is now published and we also have a blog post online and a project website and a policy paper. Thank you.